Good morning. Today we're going to look at what money is. This is your chapter 3 from our textbook. So we'll start with the definition of money. Then we will move on to what are its functions or characteristics. And towards the end of the chapter, we'll focus on quantifying money. Money is perhaps the most important thing that we have ever come across. Why is it so important? If we look at Venezuela, a very recent example, we will see that money over there started to lose its value. When money starts rapidly losing its value, this phenomenon is referred to as inflation. High inflation could be even 10%, 20%, but in Venezuela, we see inflation reaching as high as almost 1.7 million percent. This is extremely high inflation. To bring things into context, here we have a chicken which is now worth 14 million bolivars. This is obviously very high inflation and it's quickly eroding the purchasing power of cash holdings that people have. As soon as we see money losing value, we see society moving towards chaos and disorder. So the more stable money we have, the more order we'll have in our society. And the more unstable money we have, the more disorder and chaos we'll see in our society. So money is not just important from economic perspective, but it is also very important to have political stability and order in our society. What is money? So let's go over our formal definition. We have money over here as anything that is generally accepted in payment for goods and services. So it's helping you buy goods and services. Note what I have highlighted over here. Anything that is generally accepted. So what could be anything? Historically, money has been in the form of beads. It was in the form of pearls. We have seen societies using tobacco leaves as money and many other commodities out there which have been used as money. So it is anything that is generally accepted as a form of payment for goods and services or for repayments of debt. For us, money is more like currency and checking accounts. So currency would be your paper notes and your coins and checking account would be your account at a local bank where you deposit some money. This form of money, currency and checkable deposits is also what we refer to as M1 money supply. M1 money supply is the most liquid form of money, the cash or the assets that can be immediately used for purchases of goods and services. There are other aggregates of money supply also, M2, M3, M2 plus, but we'll focus on those later. But for now, your most spendable form of money is your M1 money supply over here. Now, what are checkable deposits? Checkable deposits are typically held at a bank. You deposit your money and now you can use the deposit as a means of payments for goods and services. Now, these checkable deposits or checking account balances have seen an evolution of their own in how they can be used as money. Initially, you could only use your checking account with the check. So let's write that down. So you could write a check on your checking account and now use that check for payment of goods and services. Then we saw money from your checking account could actually be withdrawn with ATM cards. Over time, we saw further evolution over here and we saw that you could now access your checking account with debit cards. And then in more recently, we have seen evolution of the usage of these checking accounts in the form of e-transfers or e-payments. So I can go online or through an app on my phone, use my checking account and immediately transfer my money from my checking account to the person who I'm making the payment to. In common usage, money is often confused with income or wealth. But since we are studying it within the course of money and banking, we want to really identify it as separate from being both income and wealth. And we cannot use them now interchangeably. So money, as we just defined, is your most spendable asset. So most liquid and most spendable. So income is in exchange for some factors of production, land, labor, capital, etc. So let's write down where we are receiving our income from. It could be in exchange for working. It could be received in exchange for renting. It could be received in exchange uh, for some royalty. So you publish a book and you're receiving royalty income. It could be from holding of some stocks. So you're receiving dividend payments, payments on your holding of bonds, etc. Now, income can also be in the form of some benefit. So your compensation is not just your paycheck. Compensation from your employer could also be in the form of accommodation. So they're giving you the rent for your house or they're accommodating you for your health expenditures. So income is not always your spendable asset, which we are defined money as. Lastly, what is wealth? 
Wealth is your overall portfolio of assets. Your assets could be in the form of stocks, bonds, your real estate that you hold. It could be holding of your gold and many other assets, valuable assets out there. And also wealth could also be held in the form of money. So remember money is not income and money is not wealth. Wealth has money as a part of its overall portfolio. Next, we're going to look at what service does money provide? So what are the functions of money? We are holding money because of its liquidity. It's the most spendable asset. That's our basic way of defining money. Why do we use money? We use money primarily for purchasing of goods and services. So that is one function that money provides us. And it is that of medium of exchange. It allows us to purchase goods and services. What did societies use when they had no money? And I'm sure a lot of you can answer that question. Before we had money, societies usually used to exchange on the basis of barter. Barter is exchange of goods and services for other goods and services. Of course, there is no law that prohibits us today from bartering goods and services. I could still go ahead and use my marker and exchange it for different type of goods and services as long as the merchants are willing to accept it. When over time, a particular type of asset becomes more acceptable as a means of payment, even in this barter economy, we'll see that markers will emerge as the common unit or the money for this economy if they are generally accepted as a means of payment. So with this very simple example, you can see how economies evolved from barter exchange to using a particular asset as money. In order to see the inconvenience associated with barter, let's go over this very simple example. So we have a small village with different type of agents over here, cook, farmer, mover, barber, carpenter, writer. Assuming we start from the cook who wants some new furniture, he will go to the carpenter and would want to exchange some good or service that he can offer, most likely a good quality meal in exchange for some furniture. If the carpenter instead wants corn, he doesn't want anything from the cook. Instead, he would rather sell his furniture to the farmer and get corn instead. And farmer, in my example, wants a haircut and not new piece of furniture. So he would rather sell his corn to the barber. Barber, in our example, actually wants to read a book. So he would rather have the services of a writer instead of a farmer. Writer over here needs to move maybe he's moving houses so he wants the services of a mover and not a new haircut so he would rather sell his new novel or his piece of writing to the mover and mover over here wants furniture and mover is quite hungry and wants to actually eat and doesn't want to read a book so we see in the society where exchange is based upon me exchanging something i have to offer with what you have to need is going to be quite inconvenient because we have to have matching needs in this example this is very obvious that they, we do not have a set of or a pair of matching needs at all whenever one of these guys wants something and the person they want it from that person actually doesn't need what they are willing to offer in exchange. This inconvenience of barter is called the double coincidence of wants. Double coincidence of wants is the primary condition that has to be met for exchange to take place in a barter economy. There are high transaction costs of finding that partner who is willing to exchange something that you need or what you are willing to offer. In our example, transaction costs would be the time spent in looking for that partner. So let's go back to our question. Why do people use money? They primarily use money as a medium of exchange. You can see as soon as we introduce money in this economy, we no longer need the requirement of double coincidence of wants. It is now no longer a necessary condition for exchange to occur. As long as you have money, which could be again these blue markers, as long as people are willing to accept these markers for getting a haircut, for moving, for buying new furniture, for um, reading a book, etc., these markers will become the money for this economy. And historically, we have seen in bartered economies two or three assets emerging as the commodity which is generally accepted as money. So from historical examples, you can take wool and barley, some of the most commonly used forms of money. And as we have just said, they eliminate your double coincidence of wants and thereby reduce your transaction costs. Not only this common commodity now which is being used as money reduces your transaction costs associated with finding that matching partner, it also promotes specialization. How does money promote specialization. In a barter economy for exchange to occur, 
I had to have a whole plethora of goods and services that I could offer to my trading partner. Now, with money introduced, whether it that money is your wool or barley, which is now generally being accepted in our society. So as long as I have some wool, which are generally accepted, I can now focus on what I am relatively good at. If I'm relatively good at giving people haircuts, I would rather specialize in that and earn lots of wool that now I can exchange for different type of goods and services. As soon as economy evolves from a bartered economy to an economy which is using some asset as a means of exchange, it will see higher specialization and better quality of living. For any type of asset to be considered a good medium of exchange, it must have certain characteristics. So let's look at those. It must be easily standardized. It should be widely accepted. It should be divisible. It should be very easy to carry. And lastly, it should not be losing its value very quickly. So what makes barley or wool better money than maybe apples? Apples, as you can see, are perishable goods. They will perish or they will rot very quickly. The second function of money or the service that the money provides is that of unit of account. So what do we mean by unit of account? It is your asset in terms of which all value is measured in your economy. With no money, we would need to have many different prices for goods and services. This will increase your information costs. How? So let's go back to the example of a barter economy and let's assume there are only three goods, X, Y, and Z. Now in this barter economy with only three goods, I would have to price X in terms of Y, X in terms of Z, and Y in terms of Z. So all goods and services need to be priced in terms of each other. Now with three goods, we have three prices and N is for goods over here. Let's add another good to this example. So if you have four goods instead, x y z and w you can see again you'll have to again price all of these goods and services in terms of each other so let's quickly do that so i have over here w in terms of x w in terms of y w in terms of z and again x in terms of y x in terms of z and y in terms of z so what do we have over here with only one more good my number of prices have actually gone up i have actually now six prices for four goods. So you can see the higher the number of goods, higher the number of prices that I'm working with. So imagine going to your grocery store and instead of seeing one ticketed price for a can of tomatoes, you have a long ticket with all of these prices in terms of different goods and services. So in a bartered economy, you're not exchanging that can of beans with a dollar. You're exchanging that can of beans with maybe half a chair, a dozen apples, half a dozen berries, etc. So the more goods we have in our bundle, the more prices we are going to have. Your problem over here of pricing these goods and services keeps on becoming more and more complicated. And we have a formula for this in order to see in a barter economy how many prices would we have for n number of goods. This formula gives you the number of prices that you will have for n number of goods. So in our first example, we had three goods and this formula gives you three prices. If your number of goods went up to four, you'll end up with six prices. And higher the number of goods, higher is the number of your prices. So if I have a thousand goods, this is giving you approximately half a million prices. So imagine the amount of information you need to know at all times for exchange in this barter economy to occur. So Barter did not only have high transaction costs associated with looking for that ideal partner with which you would have your matching need, double coincidence of warrants would be met, but also you would need to know all of this information at all times in order for fair trade to occur. So we see that a common unit of account drastically reducing your number of prices that you're dealing with. For any particular good or service, you just need one price. Effect of transaction costs in barter can also be seen with this very simple diagram. So this diagram should be very familiar to you. It's your market diagram and we have equilibrium in the market at P1. Equilibrium quantity over here is Q1. Supply curve is going to be giving you your production costs. And we are assuming that these production costs are not including any transaction costs associated with barter. If we were to have same exchange to occur in a barter economy, you would have higher transaction costs associated with looking with that partner with which your double coincidence of wants is met and also the information costs of having all of that information on you. We have a higher supply curve. As you can see, barter increases the inefficiency in this market. As a result, your price is higher and quantity 
currency exchanged is lower. In very simple terms, what is it doing to the common man in this market? It's making goods and services more expensive for him and it is making him consume less of these goods and services. We are seeing over here decline in standards of living because of barter. Conversely, if we were to take away barter and introduce money, you can see we have lower prices and we have higher quantity being consumed. So we see overall enhancement of efficiency, enhancements of standards of living due to the introduction of a common asset which is generally accepted as a means of payment and is the standard unit of account. The third function of money is when it is used as a store of value. So it's a medium of exchange, it is a unit of account and number three, it's a store of value. We hold money because it is used to transfer our purchasing power over time. Now money as a store of value is not a very good asset. Why? Because money loses value over time. We know because of inflation, prices will go up over time and money will actually lose its purchasing power. So it is not a good store of value. As medium of exchange and for unit of account, money is probably the best asset out there. There are not many good assets out there that can replace money's functionality. However, as a store of value, money is actually a not, uh, is not really providing this service in a good way. Why not? Because there are many other assets out there that can provide this function in a much better way. You can hold some of your wealth in the form of stocks. You can earn dividend payments over time. You can hold bonds and earn the yield or interest on those bonds. You can earn real, you can hold real estate. And if the real estate appreciates over time, it's a much better way of holding value over time. Traditionally, we have seen a con people preferring to hold gold instead of money. So money because of inflation is actually not a good store of value. There are many other assets that actually fulfill this function in a much better way. We see typically in times of economic crisis, we'll have high inflation. With high inflation, it ceases to be a good store of value. And in these type of situations, we'll often see people moving to an alternative currency or an alternative asset that they would rather use as money. So when we have, where we have very high inflation, money was no longer a good store of value and people are going to move to some move to some alternative asset we saw this uh, during the russian crisis of uh, 88 89 90, 90 when russia was going through a major major economic crisis and political crisis inflation was at an all time high with the rubel losing value drastically russians would actually prefer to hold us dollar instead of their local currency so whenever we have economic crisis high inflation we see an alternative asset stepping in people would not want to hold their own money as a store of value over time we have seen this in many different economies we saw this in venezuela more recently very high inflation people again moving towards the us dollar or the euro rather than holding their own currency as a store of value especially for economies which do not have alternative sources of savings so they do not have well functioning financial markets if stocks and bonds and other type of saving instruments are not easily accessible or not available we will definitely say that those people in that particular economy will switch to an alternative currency which is better at retaining purchasing power over time